We are going to start talking about what happens when you put two types of materials together. Taking up half the course just to talk about P material and N material. And now we're going to actually start putting them into usable devices. A lot of what I have to say today is mathematical in nature and involves some derivations and really if you can get the end result, you'll be fine. It's like other stuff I've done in here where I go through a long derivation and then you end up with equation at the end and that's the one that you use. So that's what we're going to do. So when P material and N material meet, they don't really meet. They're fabricated next to each other. So we don't slap them together and have something happen. But we do model how they interact by acting as if we had slapped them together and something will happen. So when P-type and N-type material is in contact, there are electrons and there are holes in proximity right at the junction. The junction actually has a name. It's called the metallurgical junction. There's no metal there, but that's what it's called. That's the actual point at which P-material and N-material meet that dividing line will kind of disappear into something else. But for right now, that is the point, kind of the midpoint, between the two types of materials. So the assumption that we make, first of all, we assume that the doping concentration on one side and the other side is not necessarily equal. The P side could be doped more heavily than the N side or vice versa. So we actually assume that that's probably going to be the case, that they're not equally doped. Um, and so what this means is there's going to be a really abrupt change in doping concentrations right at that junction, because you'll have a whole lot of electrons on the N side and a whole lot of the poles on the P side. And when they're together, what you will get is a density gradient, like we talked about before. And if you have a density gradient, you get a diffusion current. So basically, what happens is electrons and holes start to diffuse into the other region. So the majority carriers on the end side, which are electrons, start to diffuse towards the lower concentration of electrons on the P side, and vice versa. The holes on the P side diffuse over to the end side. And this has consequences. Because what ends up happening is we get ions behind. Because the N material is still the N material. The P material is still the P material and it's balanced. But once we start getting this diffusion, then the donors on the electron side and the acceptors on the other side are starting to actually lose or gain electrons that they didn't intend to do, like as if they set out to do that or not do that. But Basically, that's what ends up happening. So the region around the metallurgical junction that this happens in is called the space charge region. The space charge region has positive charges, positively charged ions on the N side and negatively charged ions on the P side. What exactly happens? This is what actually happens. What we do, first of all, we only look at the donor and the acceptor atoms. So when I show you the atoms in there, I'm only going to talk about the donors and acceptors because they're the ones that have the energy levels that are able to move electrons. So they are more able to actually have electrons move away or towards them than are the actual structure. So basically, on the N side, you have a bunch of donor atoms that have five valence electrons. And the fifth electron is black, just so that you can actually see it. And on the left-hand side and the P side are a bunch of holes. So what ends up happening is those electrons go over and meet the holes and the holes go away. And you basically have no charge carriers because all of the electrons and holes have recombined. And that's why there's nothing there to carry charge. On the right side, we just have the positive donor ions, so the donor material on that side has all become ionized. And then the same thing on the um, P side, we have a bunch of acceptor atoms that have three electrons, and they would be also ions. So we have negative ions, positive ions, and 
<coughs> you will just have to imagine that that's what's going on. So in the space charge region, I don't know why I can't talk today. <coughs> I talked fine all day long until right now, this very moment. So Ari, I apologize. My voice is terrible today. You'll have to just forgive me. Anyway, um, what ends up happening is the separation of charges, the positive and negative charges, creates an electric field across the space charge region. So you actually have an electric field that is, and this is like a PN junction that's just sitting on a table doing nothing. So this is not a PN junction connected to anything. It's just sitting there on a table, but it has an electric field inside it. <coughs> Eventually, the depletion region grows, or the space charge region, they're the same, um, until eventually the diffusion, the force of the diffusion current and the electric field balance each other, and then the space charge region is set, and it is at thermal equilibrium. So thermal equilibrium for, say, a diode, which is a PN junction, has this depletion region already in it. It has a separation of plus and minus charges, and it has an electric field inside it, even when it's not uh, doing anything. So the rest of the time today, we're going to talk about basically how the PN junction works when it's at equilibrium. We will talk later, not today, but next week, about what happens when we apply voltage. But for right now, for today, we're going to talk about PN junctions that are sitting not connected to anything. So at thermal equilibrium, you have no voltage. You have no temperature changes. And if you have that situation, you have a space charge region that has a certain width. I don't know what it is yet. You will by the end of the day, but for right now, we don't know what it is. Um, and there's an electric field, which I already talked about. And then there's also a voltage potential through that depletion region. So there's actually a change in voltage potential that happens that we'll get to in a minute. So we're going to make two assumptions when we look at the junction. One is that the Boltzmann approximation is valid, which basically means neither sector, the P or the N region, neither one of them is degeneratively doped. They're not overly doped. They're just normally normal N and P material, nothing um, extreme. <coughs> and also, we're going to assume that everything that could donate or accept an electron has already done so. So we assume complete ionization and um, that, that generally we've been assuming the whole class anyway. So when this happens, when there is no voltage applied across the PN junction, the Fermi energy level is the same throughout the system. And I've said that before. At thermal equilibrium, wherever the Fermi level is, that's where it is throughout the entire system. So through the P region and the N region, the Fermi level will be the same. And we've talked a lot about Fermi level. We've talked about how um, it's down near the valence band for P material, and it's up near the conduction band for N material. So going through that junction, something has to give in order for the Fermi energy to be close to the valence band on the P side and close to the conduction band on the N side. And what ends up happening is every other energy level bends going through this junction. So basically, on the P side, you'll notice the Fermi level is down close to the valence band. On the N side, it's up close to the conduction band. And the conduction valence and intrinsic Fermi energy have all kind of bent going through that um, junction. And the region in which that's all changing, that's the space charge region. That's basically that region that has no charge carriers. And I'm just going to make that space charge thing go away. Um, if electrons want to travel from the N to the P, or holes from P to N, but if current is going to flow through this, um, basically 
there's going to have to be some energy somewhere to get electrons so that they can kind of go up this hill, because it can. In fact, there's a potential barrier called the built-in voltage. And when you see a little E like that in front of a voltage, that means it's been converted to joules. That's all that means. That's like the charge of an electron times the voltage. Because when we have this energy diagram, we're talking about energy, so we have to talk about joules. So if you see something that says E, something or other, that just means it's been converted to another unit. That's all it is. So this is basically a voltage. It's a built-in voltage. And that has to be overcome before anything can flow through there. And there isn't anything to add energy to the system, so no current is going to flow right now. Um, the value of the built-in voltage, because we're engineers and we have to have mathematical equations and values for everything, so we do need to figure out how to calculate what this voltage is, because it's going to be different depending on doping concentrations and also the material that this is made out of. All of that will sort of go into determining um, what the value of the built-in voltage is. So the value depends on the doping concentrations of the N and the P side. And as you'll see in a minute, also depends on material. Um, when we get to this point in the course, I'm going to point out to you that from now on, when I talk about the acceptor concentration, I am talking about the doping concentration on the P side. So there will be no acceptors on the N side. There will be no donors on the P side. There will be no compensated material like we were looking at before. So that means if you know the number of acceptors on the P side, that's the number of holes available. Um, if you know the number of donors on the N side, that's the number of electrons available. So they're separated now. You will never have a situation where you have both in the same region. So, um, so we won't consider compensated material. Um, we will just consider this. It's just that for whatever reason, we use the same variables to determine both of these. But if we're going to calculate the built-in voltage, all this does, and I'm not going to derive this particular thing because it's going to look so familiar. Um, it, it's just another take the thermal voltage, multiply by the natural log of the two um, doping concentrations, and this is why, uh-oh, I did it again. I hate it when I do that. No, nope, I did okay. This is why it depends on material because of that Ni squared, and that's going to be different depending on what kind of material you have. So doping concentrations are going to affect the built-in voltage and also whatever Ni squared it is, and that's going to depend on the material. Um, the thermal voltage we've gone over multiple times that's just that same value and we're going to stay at 300 K I think for the rest of the course pretty much so that value of VT if you see KT over E you can just use that 0 0.0259 value because we will be pretty much at 300 the whole time so we're going to look at a silicon junction and we have doping concentrations of Na is 2 times 10 to the 17, and Nd is 10 to the 15. Um, and we want to calculate the built-in potential barriers. So we need to know that this is silicon, because that's going to give us our value of Ni, which is going to be 1.5 times 10 to the 10 per cubic centimeter. And then all we do is just calculate this out. The built-in voltage is going to equal the thermal voltage times the natural log of NAND over NI squared, and that's going to equal 0 0.0259 times the natural log of 2 times 10 to the 17 times 10 to the 15 over 1.5 times 10 to the 10 squared. And we get 0 0.713 volts. This is pretty typical value for silicon. Most of the time, that built-in voltage will be around 0.7 volts for silicon. This is where, if you've taken engineering electronics already, or you've ever had any experience with diodes, 
Silicon diodes, generally, we model them as having a drop of 0.7 volts because that is required in order to get the diode to conduct electricity. So this is a practical value that we see. It does vary around that value depending on what the doping concentrations are. So if we were to change this slightly, and we were to change the value of Na, for instance, and we were to lower it a little bit, so then the built-in voltage would be 0.0259 times the natural log of 10 to the 16 times 10 to the 15 over 1.5 times 10 to the 10 squared. And we would actually get 0.635 volts. So it's still around, you know, 0.6, 0 0.7. Um, it's not radically different. And those are, 10 to the 15 is a little bit of a low doping concentration. So that's, that's about as low as it'll get. And that will be an important value in the future as we move on. So now we're going to get into the more theoretical part because we've got this junction and we know the voltage that we need to kind of overcome it. And, and if you've had experience with diodes, you kind of already know that. Now we're going to get into the real theoretical, nitty-gritty, mathematical part of PN junctions, the part that we don't talk about in, in electronics. So we're going to start out by trying to find the value of the electric field. The electric field that's sitting inside the PN junction of the diode that's sitting on the desk doing nothing. We are going to use what's known as Poisson's equation, which you do not need to remember, write down, or use in any way. So it is not something that, it's like Schrodinger's wave equation. You need it to know how we get these values, but this is not something that you are going to use yourself. You're going to use the results of this yourself. So this basically relates the charge density over the permittivity to the electric field and also the electric potential. The electric, the derivative of the electric field is going to give you the charge density and the double derivative of the um, electric potential will give you the charge density. And what we're going to do is work backwards because charge density is not hard to find and we already know permittivity. So this is just basically going to involve doing a bunch of integrals because what we want to get to is the work function or the electric potential at the end. And you may or may not remember way, way back at the beginning of the course, we talked a little bit about work functions and then I said we'd come back to them later and we're back to them now. Um, but basically a work function is just another type of kind of a voltage thing. So it, it is also in volts when we calculate the value for it. All right, so we'll start out by looking at a graph of charge density versus distance. So this right here is the metallurgical junction right there. So that's the point at which the end material and the P material meet. And what, we, what this is saying is that out to a certain distance, and this is one edge of the space charge region, and this is another edge. So this whole that basically area here, that's the space charge region. And what it says is that the doping concentration on the end side is going to be the same all the way out to some distance and the acceptor concentration is going to be the same out to some distance and they don't have to be equal they're not equal actually the they're, the distances are different and the amount of charge is different but what we get from this um, if I can erase for a second without totally messing everything up I guess I can what we get from this is a way to find the charge density, which we do need. So we're going to look at the end side, that little box there, and the charge density is really just what's listed there under rho for charge. If you notice, the vertical axis is charge, 
And that value is just E <coughs> times the number of donors. That's just the charge of an electron times how many electrons there are. That's the charge density. Makes sense. We can all figure that out. That's easy to figure out. We will know that value. We know the charge of an electron, so that's easy. We, and we also know um, some other stuff. So for zero, any distance from the metallurgical junction in the end direction out to the edge of the space charge region, um, the charge density is going to be the charge of an electron times the number of donors. For the P region, it's exactly the same, except we use the negative of the charge of an electron because it's positive. So the charge of an electron is negative 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19, so we have to negate that to make it positive for holes. I know it's kind of weird, but that's what we do. And we just multiply that times the number of donors we have, acceptors that we have, sorry, and that gives us the charge density on the P side. And it, like I said, does not have to be the same on each side. It just has to be. So what we're going to do is we're going to take that charge density. And like I said, the charge density is easy because we know how many carriers we have and we know the charge of each carrier. Um, and now we need to look at the electric field. So the first part of the Poisson's equation is easy for us to get. Now we have to take that and use it to find the electric field. So we want to find the function of the electric field sort of as a function of distance because it's going to change depending on where you are from the metallurgical junction as you move farther away. The value of that electric field is going to change. So we're going to look at the N side and the P side separately. And we're going to start looking at the P side. So that's everything from x equals 0 to the left. That's the P side. And then at negative xp, that's where the space charge region ends. So the electric field part we're looking at is just between x equals 0 and that negative x of p. And we are going to take the integral of minus E N A over A to S. And A to S is just the permittivity of the semiconductor, which is the relative permittivity times the actual permittivity. It's the same thing you did in the beginning of the course when you had to take E R E O, and that's basically the same process. Uh, like for silicon, it would be 11.7 would be the relative value, and you have to multiply that by the permittivity of free space. So that's an easy value to find. So when we take that and we make a derivative of that, not a derivative, we underivative it. It's, it's still late in the day. Um, we get minus e over e at a over a to s times x plus some constant, and the, it's the some constants that always make integration no fun because we have to figure out what that constant is. The cool thing is it's not hard to find for this part. Um, if you look at the graph, when you get to E of X, it stops right here, which means it's zero at this point right here. So because of that, if we plug that value in and we, we actually can solve for C1, and C1 just ends up being um, minus E N A over A to S times X P. So when we put that in, we just get this as a final equation. So that tells us the electric field from the metallurgical junction into the P region. Halfway there. Well, not even halfway there. Partway there. On the N side, we're going to do the same thing. It's just going to come out a little bit differently, not terribly different. We're going to look at the electric field going from the end region towards the metallurgical junction. So we're going to take the same equation. We're going to integrate it. We're going to get pretty much the same result, except we have now C2. And the only difference is the electric field is going the other way relative to distance. So again, the value of the electric field ends up being 0. No, don't do that. Stop it. It's 0 at xn. So again, we can just turn this around a little bit and get a negative E N A D over E S 
times x sub n minus x. So it's just a slightly different equation, but that's just because the electric field's going in the opposite direction of distance from the metallurgical junction. So that tells us how to find the electric field um, as a function of distance. This is generally a piecewise function, basically, that describes the electric field. We can look at all three of these where we have the electric field for the P region, the electric field for the N region, and you'll notice both of those are linear equations. They're just not the same linear equation, but they are both linear equations. And then at X equals zero, the, those two functions are equal because at, there's not gonna be a jump in energy, there's going to be just the same energy at one point. So at x equals zero, there's actually a balancing, and the distance of the p side times the number of acceptors is going to end up being equal to the number of donors times the distance also. And what this means is, because this balance has to occur, the more highly doped a region is, the shorter the distance is into that region. So a region that is less highly doped will have a greater width of space charge region that goes into it than a region that's really highly doped, just to balance it out. So we're going to look at a graph of the electric field. Remember, it's piecewise linear function. And when we look at it, it just looks like this. Now you'll notice that everything for energy is negative, and that's because way back there there was a negative sign, and negative energy is actually kind of bound energy, and that we're, we just ignore that. When we want to find the maximum, we just use this value here, and we just use the magnitude. We don't care about the actual um, whatever sign on it. We just want that point there, and that gives us the maximum electric field inside that thing. We don't care if it's positive or negative. That really doesn't matter. So that means we can calculate that um, relatively easily in more than one way. Uh, if we look at the, oops, that's not what I wanted. I wanted an eraser, not a pen. There we go. Every time we're in this room, it sounds like a thunderstorm outside. <laughs> Anyway, if we look in the N region and we look at where that maximum point occurs, it occurs at x equals zero. So if we calculate that all out, we get E N D X N over A to S is that value at that point. So that's this point right here if we were calculating it from the N side. If we were calculating it from the P side, we would get something slightly different, but we already said that at x equals zero, those two things are equal. So there's two different ways we could calculate that, um, but we're not going to worry about that right now. That's just sort of giving you the graph, and then we're going to move on with that. So the electric field, what we usually want to know is the maximum value of it, because that gives us some, con what do you call it, context for what's going on inside the device. <coughs> Uh, so, as you'll notice, there's two ways to calculate it, and you should get the same answer either t each time. So, those two numbers will come out to be equivalent. So, if you happen to know only the conditions on the P side, you can still find out the maximum um, electric field. So, that is electric field. We did charge density. We did electric field, which was the derivative function. The derivative of the electric field gave us the charge density, and now we're going to go to work function. That was the last part. The work function is the difference between the Fermi energy and the intrinsic Fermi energy on each side of the junction. So there's a difference on the N side and there's a difference on the P side. And you'll notice they go in different directions, but they're both energy differences. They're both multiplied by a little e to make them into an energy. But if they were not multiplied by little e, they would be voltages. So they're also voltages. The units for them are volts. When we, well, electron volts, but that's really volts. So we're going to go back to the Poisson equation just for a minute so that you can remember where I was with that. 
And where it was was that the derivative of the work function gives us the um, electric field. So basically, if you know, we're taking away one of the derivatives for each one. So basically, we just have to integrate again. We have to integrate the electric field to get the work function. And this will actually get us somewhere eventually. So if we want to find the work function, the very general way to do it is just take the negative integral of the electric field. So we're going to look at the P region first. And this is where things get a little bit mathy for a minute, but um, they, they won't stay that way for too long. We will go and we will find C1 prime. And I went through that. You, you see the integral is really fast there. It's just written down for you. It's not, um, I didn't explain it because it's really not hard to explain. It's just a make, make the x a square over 2 and make the xb times x. And then we have to find c1 prime. So we set the potential at 0 at minus xp. And this is where it kind of starts really running out into a longer equation. But we set 0 equal to this value plus c1. And that means that negative ENA over 2 ES XP squared plus C1 prime equals 0. So C1 prime is ENA over 2 A to S XP squared. And this is still not something you have to use. So we still haven't gotten anything you actually have to use yet. So this is just where we're going. This is not, we, we still haven't arrived yet. So we're passing towns you don't even need to remember. Think about it that way. So we no, no, there's a definite reason. You have to travel down the road to get to the destination. So we have to go down the mathematical road to get there. So, yeah. This is one stop, is the work function between the Fermi energy and the intrinsic Fermi energy in the P region is this nasty long equation. And it can actually be simplified um, a little bit. Uh, we can take that and we can uh, factor out the E N A over 2 E S, and we actually get a quadratic equation, which is just a perfect square. So we can change that to something nice and concise. Um, and this isn't even something that you're going to have to use much, but at least it gets us to that point. So, yeah. Well, you have to know why I, why I, if I just went, jumped to the end, it wouldn't make any sense at all. So you sort of have to see where it comes from. Um, so we simplified the work function for the P region, and that's good. And there will be a slide later that summarizes all this stuff. So we're going to be putting it together in a minute. Um, so now we're going to go to the N region. And the N region is a little more complicated because uh, the work function has gotten to a certain point and then it's going to go on into the N region, so it's not actually starting at zero like it was in the P region. It's actually in, increased to halfway to its maximum. Um, so when we go and we look at the N region, uh, we're going to do the same thing again. We are going to take the integral of the, and basically we get pretty much almost the same integral. And we get a C2 prime, but the problem is this time, we can't set the function equal to 0 to find C2 prime. We actually have to set the equation for the P region equal to the equation for the N region at x equals 0, because that's where it's going to be the same at x equals 0. So this, what's been happening in the P region brings that work function up to a certain point, and then we have to go on from there. So we have to actually set the n function equal to the p function right at x equals 0. And if we do that, we get e n a over 2 a to s times x p squared equals c2 prime, which means that the work function on the n side actually depends on the donors and the acceptors, and it can't be simplified either. We can't. There's nothing we can do with this to make it any better. So this is kind of a long equation. But what we can do is kind of summarize all the different work functions, things that happen for different values. So at 0, we're below, we're outside the space charge region, off to the left. And then as we go into the P region, we get the equation E Na over 2 Es x plus xp squared. 
That describes that work function through the P region. Then when it gets to the N region, the next function describes that curve. And then when you get to the maximum, the maximum value is not zero, it actually has a value. If the value of x is greater than x sub n, so if we're outside the space charge region on the n side, there's something there. There's a voltage there. That's the built-in voltage. So in other words, if we graph the work function, this is kind of what it looks like if you were to graph this. Um, and it's not easy to graph, so I didn't actually graph this. I just made lines, but you, you can graph it. Um, and it will end up looking kind of like that, because I have done this before. So, if we look at that value, that maximum value is VBI. That is the energy that is, or the voltage that's preventing the electrons from passing through. And that happens at the edge of the space charge region there, which means that an alternate way we could consider the built-in voltage is we could use the work function and calculate its value at x equals x sub n, because that's where it is. It's basically right at that point. And if we do that, we can find that value, but this isn't usually what we do to find that value. So we don't usually take the two distances and the two doping concentrations and put them together and get that built-in voltage. Usually we know the built-in voltage because we've used the other way to find it, where you do VT natural log NAND over NI squared. That's what you should use to find the built-in voltage. Don't use this equation. This is a stop on the way to get to the width of the space charge region. That's really what we want to know. We know what the electric field is, and we want to know how wide it is, because you need to know that if you're doing a semiconductor device. If you have a tiny little device and the space charge region takes up the whole thing, then that's really not going to do you any good. So, since we know that XPNA equals XNND, we can use that built-in voltage equation and we can determine the width of the space charge region, the N side and the P side, because it was there in the equation. The width on the N side and the width on the P side is right there. So all we have to do is substitute in, and I'm not going to go through and derive this. I could, but you can. It's just algebra. Um, so we end up with, once we put that into that previous <coughs> equation and turn everything around and solve for the built-in volt, so no, solve for X sub N, that is the one that you actually need to know. That is the distance from the metallurgical junction into the end region. And this is the distance into the P region. And then the width of the space charge region is just the sum of both. So that, that's like the destination. That's where we finally got to. The reason that I have to do all that I have to do is so that you understand where the dependencies come from. Why it depends on 2 times eta s times the built-in voltage over the electron charge and then why we have all those Na and Nds in there. That's just because we took the built-in voltage equation and substituted and turned it around and that's all we did. Um, it just takes way too much paper to try to go through all that. Example, we have a PN junction at 300K, because that's where we're going to be. We have doping concentrations of NA equals 10 to the 16 on the P side, and ND equals 10 to the 15 on the N side. We want the space charge width and the peak electric field. And we determined VBI previously. We just did that in the other example. We changed the doping concentration of... Uh, the acceptors, and we already got that value of the built-in voltage, and we also have the dielectric constant of silicon because we need that as 11.7. So we want to know the space charge width, which means we're going to use this big, long equation here, 2 eta s VBI over the charge of an electron times... Na plus Nd 
over Na Nd. And we're going to raise all that to the one half, so basically taking the square root. And let's see if I can actually have room to write all this. For the permittivity, we have to use the relative permittivity of 11.7 and also the permittivity of free space, which is 8.85 <clears throat> times 10 to the minus 14 if we're doing centimeters, which we are. And then the built-in voltage was 0.635. And we divide that by the charge in an electron. And then we multiply by the charges where you have 10 to the 16 plus 10 to the 15 over 10 to the 16 times 10 to the 15. And we take the square root of all that. And we get zero point. 951 times 10 to the minus 4 centimeters, because it's going to come out in centimeters. And this is a caution I'm going to give you, and probably most of you are going to forget that I said this, but when you come out with your answer, it's always going to be in centimeters. So if you come out with 10 to the minus 4 centimeters, that's actually the same as micrometers, if it's 10 to the minus 4. If it's 10 to the minus 6, that's not micrometers. If you get an answer and it's times 10 to the minus 6, it's 10 to the minus 6 centimeters, which is not micrometers. 10 to the minus 4 will give you micrometers if you really want to change it. My advice is take the answer you get and put centimeters after it and don't try to change the units. Um, and I'm only telling you this because it happens a lot that the answer comes out, it says 10 to the minus 6, and student writes micrometers and forgets that the answer was in centimeters. Um, so we can get the width, and in order to get either the electric field, we're going to have to find the value uh, in going into the um, X region and the P region, so I'm just going to do that anyway. Uh, I'm going to make myself some room, if I can remember to use an eraser instead of a pen. There we go. Okay. And if we just wanted the distance into the X region, we would just do 2 A to S VBI over E, then NA over ND, 1 over NA plus ND to the 1 half. And I'm not going to take the time to write all the numbers in again, because I just did that. So you know what numbers should go in here. When we go through, we get 0 0.8644 times 10 to the minus 4 centimeters. <coughs> And for the P side, there's more than one way you can do this. You can either take the width and subtract X sub N, and that will give you X sub P, because the two added together will be that value. Or you can go through and calculate it, and it's almost the same calculation, except you have ND over NA instead of NA over ND. So that's the only difference that you get. And when we calculate, we get 0 0.0864 times 10 to the minus 4 centimeters. And hopefully, if you add those two together, you get the width that we calculated earlier, which I know we did. So the other part of the question is to ask for the peak electric field. And when we do that, we just get E max. And like I said, we usually just take the magnitude of it. We don't usually look at the sign because it really doesn't matter. So we can use the equation for the end side if we like. And actually, yeah, I forgot I'm doing the, I'm not doing the sign, so I need to take that out, don't I? That negative sign. Okay, start over. E and D over A to S times xn minus x. And the maximum occurs at x equals 0. So that gives you the max 
E field. So we don't actually need to use that X part. We're just going to take 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19. Multiply it by the number of donors, which is 10 to the 15. Multiply by the width in the N region, which is 0.8644 times 10 to the minus 4. And then we're going to divide all that by 11.7 times 8.85 times 10 to the minus 14. And we get 1.34 times 10 to the fourth volts per centimeter. And that is pretty typical for the electric field strength. It usually comes out in the tens of thousands per centimeter. Um, it's not doing anything. It doesn't have any current going through it. Um, but it is a rather significant electric field inside the diode that is sitting on the table doing nothing. So that is what happens inside a diode that is sitting on a table doing nothing. Next week, we'll talk about what happens to a diode when we actually apply voltage to it in each direction. And we'll see what happens to the energy levels and how things change.